the only thing you should be focused on is squeezing your muscles. Okay. Every single thing that's that is included in the workout aside from squeezing the muscles, meaning like the number of reps you're doing, the amount of weight that you're doing, uh, the music, everything like that, that is a distraction from squeezing your muscles. Hi, this is Deron Brown and I'm your host of a podcast for men. I have a great guest with me. His name is Charlie Cates. He is a former collegiate athlete. He played basketball for Williams College in Williamstown, Massachusetts. Now he is a fitness and health instructor. Um, I'm going to allow, allow Charlie to introduce himself, um, tell us a little bit about his background, where he's from, and why he does what he does. Awesome. Duran, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. I'm very excited to be speaking with you today. Yeah, thanks. For, like I said, man, thank you for uh, contacting me because uh, yeah. after you contacted me, I read your book. I can relate to you on so many different levels. You know, people awesome. looking at me, they see my physique. I'm a mm -hmm. collegiate athlete. They praise nice. me, but I feel sore all the time. I always feel injured. I don't feel like I can perform yeah. the way that I know I can perform. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad we're going to get into this uh, during this podcast. Yeah, right on. I mean, like you were saying with your story, it's very similar to my own where, you know, all growing up, I played basketball through high school, through college. But by the time and, and, and I should say during that time, like sports performance was my thing. Like I loved working out, but, you know, to help me perform as a basketball player. But by the time I finished playing, playing college basketball, like my body was completely shot. Meaning like I couldn't stand up out of bed in the morning without the entire right side of my body tightening up from my foot all the way up, up to my neck. You know, I could like go for, you know, I could hike the Grand Canyon, but I couldn't go for a run for more than 10 minutes without my body screaming at me to stop. So like I knew something was wrong because even though from the outside looking in, you would have looked at me like much like yourself and be like, oh yeah, like that guy looks strong. That guy looks fit. That guy looks athletic. Like internally, my body was broken, you know, falling asleep every single night with ice packs trapped to my joints. And it really wasn't until I started changing my understanding and my mentality of, around exercise that things within my own, my own body started to change. Typically, why does that happen? Because right now I'm in my 30s and mm -hmm. I'm still in contact with a lot of the people I play college ball with. Yeah. And I'll tell them like, man, I feel way better now in my 30s than I felt when I was in my early 20s. I know yeah. that I can't put on 50 pounds and run a four or five forty, but as far sure. as feeling good, I feel mm -hmm. way better now than I did when I played college ball. Like why is the reasons behind that? I'm sure you have something similar to that. Yeah. So one of the biggest things is that when we are indoctrinated into sports, from the moment we start seeing sports as our way of working out, we associate the sacrifice of our health and of our body as part of the working out process. Meaning like if you're playing your game and so you, you said the 40 times, so I'm guessing you played football. Um, yes. So, yeah. So if you're, you know, in the, in the fourth quarter of your game and you're running down the sideline and all of a sudden you just stop and say, I, I'm just a little bit too tired. Your teammates would have been like, dude, what the heck? Like yeah, this, like this is the moment, like you have to go sacrifice your body, sacrifice your health for the good of everybody else, for the team, for the outcome of the win. All right. The problem with that is when we spend years having that be our mindset around exercise and around working out, like training our body to be able to perform and do that. Now, all of a sudden, we've spent years sacrificing the health and function of our body. Okay. And, and, and the thing about it is, is when you are in your early teens, mid teens, late teens, and even into their early 20s, you can kind of tolerate that for a little bit. But by the time guys hit their mid 20s, late 20s, and definitely their 30s, if they don't change how they're working out, your body's just saying enough. So like for me, I experienced that in my early 20s where my body's just like enough. OK, it sounds like you can experience that as well. Like when you finished playing college football, your body's just like, yeah, just enough. Like I can't do this anymore. This continuous sacrifice of my health in order to score the touchdown or stop somebody from scoring the touchdown in order to score the basket or stop somebody from scoring the basket. And so it just catches up with us after a while, even though up to that point, you know, for the majority of our life, our body could tolerate it. And then our body just says no more. So then we get this time off where we are not just sacrificing our health every single time we try to go and exercise. And your body actually starts to respond the way it's supposed to respond to working out, which is like in a really positive manner because you're not breaking it down every single time. 
you know, I knew something was wrong, you know, ever since high school, you know, mm. I would tell coaches would tell me like, oh, you have to pay, play through injuries. You have to be tough. Mm. And you, you drill that into your mind. You think that, OK, if I'm really yeah. going to do this, this is if I'm if I don't do it, I'm weak. Mm -hmm. You know, and I had that mentality all through college. Like mm -hmm. we would be lifting like I played football for the University of Utah. And mm. they would have us lifting insane amount of weight, packing on all mm -hmm. these different pounds. Sure. I remember I would get like my knees would hurt. My lower back would hurt. Like I, I'm still dealing with like lower back injuries. Like it, it, sure. it pains. It comes it comes and goes. Mm -hmm. But um, I always thought that, hey, you know, if I'm going to be great, I have to push through this pain because pushing through this yep. pain is going to make me a better athlete. Sure. I realized like just by resting a few days or resting just mm -hmm. a day and then really filling my body through the lifts, through mm -hmm. the motion, it yeah. really helped me prolong my strength for uh, the long run. Absolutely. I want to know a little bit more about your background. So in your book, sure. you say that you worked with Drew Brees and Aaron mm -hmm. Rodgers. Like, how did that all happen? Yeah, thanks so much for asking that. So um, the summer of 2009, I had an internship in San Diego, California. One of my college teammates was able to connect me with the uh, training facility in Scripps Ranch called Fitness Quest 10. Um, and the head guy there, Todd Durkin, uh, he, he was one of my mentors during the summer. And he had been Drew Brees' trainer for years. And then that was actually the summer that Aaron Rodgers also came and trained with them. So like Drew was there. Aaron was there, LaDainian Tomlinson was there. Um, it was a phenomenal atmosphere to be in, especially because at that point in my life, like my focus really was sports performance. So it was so cool seeing these guys. You know, the next year, Drew went and won the Super Bowl. The year after that, Aaron went and won the Super Bowl. So it was so cool seeing these guys like at, you know, near the pinnacle of their career from like a winning perspective um, and just seeing their approach and their mentality to the day in and day out off season work. It, it was such a gift that I was able to receive at that point in my life. Um, and yeah, very fortunate to have that. What is the mentality of an athlete that's performing at that level? Because I'm sure that they're, they're more mature. They understand their bodies better than anybody else. Do they sure. still kind of have that mentality of working through pain or do they have a better understanding of you know, how their body functions, how they should actually, how they should work hard, yeah. but also work, work in a way that allows them to, to sustain the whole season. Last Absolutely. Entire season. Exactly. Yeah. So they have a completely different understanding of it. And, and part of it is their maturity as an athlete and understanding what's important. Part of it is the training staff with them. Um, because, you know, in when a guy's in high school and they're more elite, the goal is to get to college. When a guy's in college and they're more elite, the goal is to get to the NFL. Once you're in the NFL, for a lot of guys, the goal is like, yeah, you like you want to win a Super Bowl, you want to have like a Pro Bowl, everything like that, but you also want to be in the league for as long as possible. So, so you're not going to be, you know, playing college ball for more than like four or five years. You're not playing high school for more than four years, but you would like to have a longer NFL career than four years, right? So, so yes. it becomes more of a longevity perspective. The other thing is is they understand that like the times during their year when they need to peak, when they need to be playing really, really well, they need to be entering training camp, like feeling really good, right? Like no injuries coming in. And then they need to have enough strength, enough uh, physical fitness to be able to last long enough throughout the season that even though their training isn't going to be as hard from a weight perspective, they're still able to maintain. So there's a very fine balance there of like, okay, we need to make Make sure that we build enough strength, enough conditioning and everything during this offseason, but may, but also not do too much that you go into training camp with anything weird or, or funky feeling going on. Um, and then also make sure that we're really heavy on the skills perspective and component and just kind of working through that. So the biggest thing was is they weren't doing like super heavy weights or anything. Um, they were really focused, uh, very focused on form, very focused on skills work. Um, um, and adding in kind of a lot of like circuits and conditioning type stuff so they could build their strength and their fitness at the same time without having to do super long workouts. Okay, that makes sense. I want to take a few step backs and I want to learn more about your collegiate career. I want to know yeah. about the injuries you sustained during your collegiate career. Sure. I'm sure that those injuries you're experiencing in college has a lot to do with why you're doing what you're doing now. So can yeah. you just go into that a little bit? Absolutely. So, um, you know, when I was 
I think in fifth grade, that was the first time like I rolled my ankle. And it seemed like every single basketball season, I'd roll at least one, if not both ankles every single year, like through my senior season, uh, senior year of college. Okay. But that's just kind of all it was. It was like a sprained ankle, you know, you would wrap it up tighter, ice it, you know, maybe be out like, you know, a few days at most, never during the season, but you know, off season, you might take a little bit more time off. Um, and then you would just kind of get back to playing with it. And over the course of however many weeks or months, it would just kind of work itself out. And so like fortunately, knock on wood, that was about the extent of like the actual injuries that I sustained. But what I found by the end is that all those little kind of like micro traumas to my ankles, they, they, it resulted in like chronic pain and chronic tightness through my hips, through my low back, up into my shoulders by the time I finished playing. Um, you know, my senior season, we had a, a really magical season. Uh, we ended up going, you know, undefeated at home. We won our uh, conference, won our conference tournament, ended up going to the final four and playing for a national championship. Um, and that, that was something that was just you know, it, it's truly like a once in a lifetime thing um, that was so amazing to experience. So from a college career perspective, you know, we had two tournaments or sorry, yeah, two um, appearances in the NCAA tournament, my freshman and senior year, um, two conference titles, um, tournament titles, my freshman and senior year. And then my senior year, we had an extremely dominant team. And like I said, we went 30 and two and went all the way to the uh, national championship game. Um, so that was kind of like my college career in a nutshell. But like I said, fortunately, um, I wasn't super injury prone from the way of like knock on wood, like no knee injuries, no, um, you know, like real shoulder injuries or whatever, but it was just little chronic kind of traumas all throughout from the time, you know, I was 11 until I was 23 that by the time I finished playing, my body was just done because of this day in day out pain day in day out tightness that really didn't seem to resolve itself no matter what I tried to do. I can relate to that. I definitely dealt dealt with like some little tiny pains that will keep coming here and there. And I was telling myself, like as I was reading your book, I was thinking to myself, thank God I never had any major injuries. I definitely mm -hmm. knew some five-star athletes who had shoulder injuries, knee injuries, yeah. career ending injuries. And it's like, man, you know, mm -hmm. it, it, it brings things back that come back down to earth because you're so focused on yourself when you're you're an athlete. But then when you see other great athletes fall and they have the potential to make all these money, all this money, yeah. it's like, whoa. You know? I know. Yeah. It just changes yeah. things so quickly for guys. And, you know, a lot of times um, when I talk to athletes, I say, hey, you know, like I know you were trying to improve your performance, but like Key number one needs to make sure that your performance doesn't get worse. And the fastest way to make sure your performance doesn't get worse is through injury. So like you have to at all costs, like try your best to not get injured. Not that anybody's ever going and trying to get injured, but there's some very specific things that you can do with your training to greatly reduce the, the chance that uh, your training actually is contributing to your injuries. You know, whether, whether they are more traumatic in nature or whether they're just kind of these minor chronic things um, that, that compile over time. Uh, but yeah, it's like, you know, one ACL goes and then all of a sudden, you know, what, what was going to be like an amazing yeah. next three, five, 10 years. It's like everything changes. Well, let's get into that. Cause you said there's definitely like, as you're training, you do not want to get injured during your training. Like, yeah. what do you mean by how can somebody train hard, train well, but then also um, prevent injury, prevent injuries from occurring? Yeah, absolutely. You know, a lot of times when we think about getting tra uh, getting injured while we're training or working out, you know, we think of like the classic uh, gym fail videos, you know, where, where we're watching somebody do an exercise and it's like this big thing, like their knee gives out or the barbell flips or something like that. And it's like, wow, like that's definitely an injury. So, I mean, there's like the, the, the I'm going to call it like the dumb stuff you can clearly avoid. But the yeah. things that really get guys um, are are the distractions while they're exercising. So let me talk about what I mean by that. When you exercise, the only thing you should be focused on is squeezing your muscles, okay? Every single thing that's, that is included in the workout, aside from squeezing the muscles, meaning like the number of reps you're doing, the amount of weight that you're doing, uh, the music, everything like that, that is a distraction 
from squeezing your muscles, okay? And the reason why that's such an issue is because when you look at the ways that, that guys end up getting injured or that their workouts contribute to their injuries, there's two big things. One, they use too much range of motion. I say like nobody ever, it's rare that ever anybody ever gets injured just like standing in neutral, all right? It's always at more of an extreme of range of motion. A knee goes a certain way, a spine goes a certain way, a shoulder goes a certain way, and all of a sudden there's an injury. Usually that doesn't happen when you're just kind of there in neutral, all right? So your range of motion you need to be very mindful of. And one of the biggest things that influences your range of motion is your speed, how fast somebody is moving, okay? And so- if you think about, okay, we want to minimize the likelihood that our speed you, uh, causes us to use too much motion. That means from a speed perspective, we need to slow things down a whole bunch, all right? Then we also want to make sure that the range of motion that we're using is very appropriate for our body. And I'll talk about what I mean, what appropriate means. But the way to go about doing that, the easiest way, is to just focus on squeezing your muscles, all right? When you try to make that strong mind-muscle connection and keep that the entire time you're doing an exercise, by nature, you're going to have to move a lot more slowly because you're, you, you are focusing on something that's not the motion. You just focus on squeezing your muscles and you in, in order to keep that mind-muscle connection, you're going to have to move slower. So we can kind of damper that speed component. Number two is the range of motion. When you focus on squeezing your muscles, not only do you send more signal to the muscles, but you have a greater perception of what's happening with the muscles. More signal is sent back up to the brain and you get to, you, you have, um, a greater kind of a sensation of understanding what's happening with your body as you're moving through the range of motion. Why this is important is because uh, as you're doing an exercise, your body will start to tell you when something's feeling just a little bit weird, not that there's pain or that there's necessarily discomfort, but your body will start to tell you, okay, yeah, you know what? Like this is feeling just a little bit off for our shoulder. We need to change how we're doing that exercise, okay? If you are focused on the music or the weight or the reps or anything like that, you're going to be kind of like deaf to those the, that that um, your body talking to you. You're not going to perceive it as well. But if you're locked into just focusing on squeezing your muscles, that will allow you to perceive to a much greater degree what your body is telling you and then allow you to change your exercise accordingly. All right. So the big thing, the big kind of takeaway from that is while you're doing an exercise, focus on squeezing your muscles. It's going to keep your motion more appropriate for your body and it's going to keep your speed more appropriate for your body. OK. And so those are those, that then that dampers kind of the two biggest ways that guys end up getting injured from their workouts. You know, I remember reading that within your book, man, and um, it was about I want to say about a month or so ago. I stopped wearing my headphones to the gym and mm -hmm. I stopped doing that because I felt like I was just out of tune, whether that be my mind drifting as I'm doing in between my sets yeah. or like somebody, a friend of mine or somebody's there and they're, they're like talking to me or something like music True. is such a distraction. Your phone is yes. such a distraction. Yes. You know, and um, what, since, since I've done that, I feel like I I'm more aware of my breathing pattern. If anything, mm -hmm. like I can yeah. tell when I'm getting stressed out during a lift Mm -hmm, or when mm -hmm. like, you know, there's just the, the rhythm of my breaths aren't the same. So it really sure. helps me focus during that. Um, definitely. Yeah. yeah. One yeah. of the things that you mentioned in your book that stood out to me was mm -hmm. working out to exhaustion rather than counting mm -hmm. reps. Mm -hmm. You want to do your sets to fatigue. Yes. Can you explain the benefits of doing that? Yeah, absolutely. So there's this notion in the fitness industry that like the results you get from your workouts from like from lifting weights um, are based on some magical rep range. What I mean by that is like, oh, if you want to develop your power, you want to do something for one to three reps. And if you want to develop strength, you do it for three to five reps. And then if you want to grow your muscles bigger, you do it for eight to 12 reps. And if you're looking at endurance, you're going to do it for 15 reps plus or whatever. The reality is it's complete nonsense, all right? The number of actual reps that you do doesn't matter. Your body doesn't know the number of reps. What it knows is the amount of challenge that it's having to overcome and the duration of that challenge, okay? So those are the two things that you need to keep in mind. How much are you challenging your body and how long are you challenging your body for? Now, the duration of the challenge, that's what's typically referred to as like time under tension, okay? 
And so I'm a huge proponent of instead of thinking about, oh, I'm going to do this exercise for eight reps or 12 reps or 15 reps or whatever, trying to aim for a certain amount of time that you're doing the exercise, okay? And by the end of that time, whether it's 30 seconds, 45 seconds, 60 seconds, you want to be at a very high level of fatigue, okay? Meaning you want to feel like your muscles have been really challenged to the point that maybe they can't do another rep. They can't do any more challenge at that intensity, all right? Those are the things that are actually going to drive the changes that we're wanting from building muscle, building strength, and building our health and function overall. So this is a key switch. The great thing about it, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> the great thing about it is simply from switching your mindset from reps to duration and challenge, <clears throat> that in and of itself will help you stay safer during your workouts. Why? Reason being is because if I'm doing, say, uh, an exercise and I want to get 12 reps, all right? Well, there's a few ways I can get 12 reps. The first way is I can pick a weight and I can just crank out 12 reps, not be worried about my form, not even be worried about, you know, the challenge or anything like that, but just, you know, okay, the weight went up and down 12 times. Big deal. In the grand scheme of things, that's really not going to do that much, okay? Uh, another way is I can say, okay, well, I'm picking this weight and I get to rep number 10 and I'm like, oh, I got to really squeeze this out. So you know what? I got to get two more reps. So I'm going to try to compromise my form and compensate in order to try to get the weight up and down a couple more times. Well, that sets you up for risk for injury. All right. The third way is guys will be like, okay, well, you know what? I need to, uh, you know, get to 12 reps. Um, so I'm going to get to, you know, I'm at rep number 10 and I feel like I'm really fatiguing. Um, well, I'm just trying to make this as easy for myself as possible. So I'll bring in whatever other muscles or do whatever I have to in order to get the, uh, the last couple of reps up. Again, that's something that's going to set you up for injury. All right. So if you can understand that it's not about the number of reps, it's about the challenge and the duration of the challenge. Now, all of a sudden, when you are wanting to do an exercise for 60 seconds and you are 50 seconds in, so you got 10 seconds left. If you can understand that, well, it doesn't matter if the weight goes up and down. All that matters is that I challenge my muscles. You can lean into that fatigue. Like mentally, you can say, oh, that, that burning that I'm feeling, that, that uh, muscle discomfort, that muscle fatigue that I'm feeling, that is the thing that I'm actually going for. I can embrace that. I can focus on that instead of trying to block it out by, you know, like, like you were saying, like, you know, trying to uh, drone it, drain it out with your music um, or, you know, try to take your mind elsewhere. You can really hone in with that mind muscle connection, focus on that squeeze and then not worry about trying to do whatever you can to fling up a couple more reps. Just stay locked in on the squeeze. Uh, keep it going for that next 10 seconds. And when the 60 seconds is up, perfect. You, you got your duration and you got your challenge, which are the things that are going to drive your health. And you just on a way that's going to keep you safe. Man, you made a good point about like compromising your form to get those last few sets. When I played college ball, um, I want to say occasionally we would do like our max out lifts and we would do our max out sure. lifts just so that we can get a percentage of that max lift. And then the coaches can create like a, a schedule right. for our, um, the list for the season. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember that um, it was time to do our max lift and I was set to deadlift 600 pounds. Wow. So I was lifting, I was deadlifting it. And I remember that my back, it started to round up, but I uh -huh. still did what I need to do to lift it up. Sure. And then, right. Like, I tweaked my lower back and yeah. my lower back to this day, it has not been the same. One of the things oh. that has helped though, is like routinely doing squats mm -hmm. and not really going really heavy, but really strengthening mm -hmm. my hips, hips has nice. been taking pressure off of my lower back. Something I noticed like within the last year, actually. But awesome. Definitely. It, it has definitely scared me when it came to like lifting heavy or doing anything mm -hmm. that could yeah. potentially like pinch those lower, um, lower back nerves. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned as well in your book is the importance of setting fitness goals. And then you also mentioned like measuring fitness. So I want to know, how do you measure somebody's fitness and why yeah. is it important to set fitness goals? Mm, good question. Okay. So I think a lot of times when we go about uh, thinking about 
measuring our our health or our performance um, or our fitness, we end up thinking about a lot of things that are outside of our body. All right. And so what do I mean by that? It's like, how many push-ups can I do? All right. Well, a push-up is something that happens from the outs- outside looking in. Okay. A- outside, you know, somebody observing somebody else like, okay, cool. Like they're doing push-ups. How many push-ups can I do? How fast can I run a mile? A mile is a distance that's outside of your body and you're trying to take your body from point A to point B. Okay. So it's a goal that's outside of your body. Um, what I would propose instead is to look at goals that are more relative to inside of your body, okay? Looking at the health and function of your body when we're talking about using exercise to build the health and function of your body. And by improving what's happening within your body, then you're going to have a much greater opportunity to create those, or to achieve those external goals that you're wanting to achieve, whether it's, you know, running a mile in a certain amount of time, doing a certain amount of push-ups, you know, whatever it is, um, but do so in a way that doesn't set you up for injury and whether the results become more sustainable. So what should we be looking at from a from a goal perspective or like a marker of progress perspective? There's five different things uh, that, that I invite people to consider. Um, number one, is how connected do you feel to your muscles during and after your work, uh, d- during your workout, I should say. How connected do you feel to your muscles during your workouts? Meaning if you are doing a lift and you, you, let's say you're doing a chest press, all right? And you can really, the first couple sets, like you really feel your chest muscles squeezing, but by the third set, it just starts to feel like general fatigue in the area. Well, that may be a sign that now your workouts are starting to compromise your internal health and function. Like, your awareness, your mind muscle connection is starting to diminish. And that could be a sign that you're kind of not going in the right direction. However, if you, if by the time you finish your workout, if you know, the first set, the second set, the third set, and your, your connection, that mind muscle connection just keeps getting stronger. That awareness piece just keeps increasing. To me, that's a sign that your workouts are progressing your internal health and function, that things are going in the right direction. So number one is how connected do you feel to your muscles uh, during your workout? Number two, is how well do you feel like your joints are moving during your workouts, okay? A lot of times when we think of joint motion, we think of like flexibility, Um, but I want you to think about how easily you can move doing the exercises that you're trying to do. So you talked about doing a squat, okay? So like how well do you feel like your hips are moving as you descend? How well do you feel like your knees are moving as you descend? How well do you feel like your ankles are moving as you descend, okay? And so thinking about those things during the, during the exercise and taking note of that, if you're feeling like certain areas of your body are starting to tighten up, or if you feel like um, one side of your body starts to move not as well as the other side of your body, to me, those are those are markers that things may be going in the wrong direction from a health and function perspective. However, if you notice that your range of motion continues to increase over the course of the workout, or your body feels more balanced, feels more even out, evened out by the time you finish your workout. To me, those are signs that you are going in the right direction from a health perspective uh, as as you are exercising. Um, Number three is how aware are you? Before before you get into number three, Mm -hmm. you mentioned um, fatiguing, muscle fatigue. So I always believe that if you're doing your sets and you're on set three and then your muscle starting to get fatigued, that's a sign that you're pushing your muscle hard. Sure. You're you're pushing it hard and you're you're strengthening that muscle. But basically... From what you're saying is I understand the concept of squeezing that muscle, really yeah. feeling the range of motion through that mm-hmm. muscle. Yeah. But let's say the muscle is fatigued. Is that a sign that, OK, maybe you're done with this workout? Your muscles have done everything that it could do. With yeah, this exercise? I, pr- I appreciate that question. Um, so when I what I, I um, want to clarify with that is. If you feel like the area of your body, like the very specific area of your body that you were trying to work with that exercise, that area feels fatigued, awesome. Like in so many ways, like fatiguing and challenging our muscles really kind of is the purpose of exercise. So then, you know, we are able to get those health benefits from exercise, that that muscle challenge. Um, 
what a lot of times happens is when we'll do, do a chest press, we might start off feeling our chest, but by the end, we're starting to feel fatigue in our shoulders. We're starting to feel fatigue in our triceps. We're starting to feel fatigue throughout like our entire, like either a greater area of our body than we are trying to work, or it just feels like general systemic fatigue. Like, it, like the days when you did your max out lifts, okay? And when you do, would do your max out deadlift, like it probably wasn't just your uh, like your your hamstrings and your glutes and your back and like your grip that felt really worked. Like when you go to like max effort as hard as you can, there's this feeling of just like total systemic fatigue. Just and so so if people are getting to that point where it's not just the areas that they work. If you feel in the areas that you work awesome. If it feels like more than that, if it feels like, Hey, they're like my whole upper body or my whole system is just feeling fatigued. Then that's a sign that what you did at some level is probably inappropriate for your body. And, and from a health perspective, things may be trending downhill a little bit, man. I'm what you're saying is speaking to me. Cause um, I actually wake up at 4 AM. I go to gym at 5 AM for two hours, two hour lifts, do some plow metrics, some lifting, Nice. And then I'll go for an hour long run, wow. but I compete. I also compete in uh, karate and boxing and I have wow. practice at six o'clock, five to okay. six o'clock. I have practice for those. Yeah. And I'm so drained by the time I have to do karate and boxing. And yeah. I'm just like, man, something like just reading your book actually made me think about, I was like, man, I'm not doing something right because mm. I should be energized. I should be able to push through. Um, yeah, I should be exhausted when I have to spar or when I have to hit like the punching sure. bag, like my entire body is like pushing through it. Yeah, and, um, yeah. I may be just doing too much or doing something incorrect. Yeah. One thing you it... also mentioned was flexibility. Yes. You talked about flexibility. And in your book, you said that flexibility, um, it can't achieve how achieving flexibility can be detrimental. So what mm. are how do you recommend somebody achieves flexibility and what are they doing wrong? right now when it comes to flexibility? Yeah, 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 man. Thank you so much. This is a great question. So um, uh, when we think about flexibility, oftentimes it's more it's more or less this mindset of, well, if some is good, more must be better. So let's just try keep trying to get it um, at, you know, at all costs because, you know, the more flexible and limber you are, the better your joints can move, the better overall. Um, and joint motion is certainly important from a joint health perspective. The problem is, is that when you move more than what your body, when you move more than what your body is, um, for lack of a better term, like happy about moving at that time, uh, your nervous system can start to kind of decrease the amount of signal that's being sent to your muscles, okay? And when you do that repeatedly, you can start to disrupt the function of your muscles, which is to help protect your joints, which is to, you know, obviously move your joints. Um, but then there are so many other health benefits that come from well-functioning muscles. And so the challenge that a lot of people run into is when you're really focused on just trying to, you know, stretch further or just trying to improve your joint mobility and you don't have the accompanying uh, strengthening piece, the, the accompanying muscle function piece with it, uh, you may end up with joints that move well, but without the, the muscle support of those joints. And the problem with that is, you know, we've been talking about injuries, you know, for, for the majority of this interview, uh, when you see somebody's tibia stay still or their lower leg stay still and their knee go a different way than it should. That's a great example of somebody who had a lot of motion at that joint, but did not have the protection of their muscles at that joint. Okay. And so the risk with continuing to try to increase, um, increase flexibility, uh, with, out the accompanying strengthening piece is that long term you may be setting yourself up for injury uh, because you are increasing your joint motion to the point that your body can't actually uh, protect those joints because you've decreased the function of the muscles throughout the flexibility processes. You know, I never thought about it like that. You know, um, something I do, I go to hot yoga occasionally. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I've all whenever I see somebody doing like ridiculous splits or they, you know, they're I, I want to say like they're double jointed. That's what they say. Sure, sure. Like think muscles in inappropriate ways. I always thought that was a, a good sign of like great flexibility. But mm -hmm. 
as you're saying, like if you don't have the muscle to really complement that, it's mm -hmm. really you're you're really hurting yourself for the long run. You yeah. Know? So I never thought of it like that because especially when you're doing your lifts and you're going through the range of motion, motion, mm -hmm. you're getting not only are you building that muscle, you're building up the joints, you're building up all the supporting um, parts of your body as well. Yeah. You know. So I, I never thought about flexibility in that way. Um, it, one it, of the things it, I really it, want to know is how do you, how can you boost your recovery after a workout? Mm, yeah. So um, to me, the easiest way to boost your recovery after a workout is to work out in the way that actually sets you up to come back and work out again the next day. And the way, and that's for working out appropriately for your body. Now, what does that look like? Well, number one, it looks like you can challenge and fatigue your muscles, but not getting to that point of like systemic fatigue, like, like, like we were talking about. Okay. Uh, number two, making sure that you are respecting your range of motion, not trying to use too much range of motion for your body, but staying within what your body says is symptom free. Um, and where you can maintain that mind muscle connection. And then which leads right to number three is maintaining the mind muscle connection during the workout will allow you to be better in tune with, you know, what your body's telling you during the workout. So you can make the adjustments that you need to by the end or throughout the workout. So by the end, you actually feel better connected with your body. You actually feel stronger. You actually feel more energized at the end of your workout. And you're like, okay, well, the thing that I just did over the last 20, 30, 60 minutes, now I feel like I can come back and do that again tomorrow. Okay. Now that works, that, that can certainly work well for a lot of people, but if you're finding that the, that, um, you're finding that you are maybe pushing yourself uh, more than than you're intending to during your workout, or you're finding that hey, I'm still not recovering quite as well after my workouts. Um, there's a there's a couple things I'd recommend. Um, number one, or what I call like deload days or deload weeks. All right, and essentially it's doing the workout that you would normally do, but using anywhere from 50 to 80 percent of the weight and 50 to 80 percent of the volume. So for example, if you're doing a chest press and you're using 100 pounds and you do it for 10 reps, um, instead of saying, okay, tomorrow when I go and I do my chest press, instead of using 100 pounds for 10 reps, I'm going to use 50 to 80 pounds and do five to eight reps. Now, just thinking about that, it's going to be like, well, is that even going to be challenging? And it's really not going to be that challenging, but it will give you an opportunity with a lighter weight to really strengthen and focus in on squeezing your muscles and, and, and strengthen that mind-muscle connection, which again will leave you, uh, which will... Um, take you from that workout into the next one, feeling more connected to your body. Okay. You do that for an entire workout or you do that for an entire week and that can help your body recover. That can help your nervous system recover just by decreasing the intensity and decreasing the load on it. Uh, the second thing I'd recommend is looking at some bouts of steady state cardio, uh, 20 to 30 minutes, um, keeping your heart rate kind of between 50 to 65% of your maximum heart rate, whether it's walking on a treadmill an elliptical, uh, you using a stationary bike or going outside, you know, strap on a heart rate monitor and just kind of monitor where your heart rate's at for that period of time. That in and of itself has been shown to be more effective at boosting recovery than like not doing anything at all. than just saying, Oh, I'm just going to kick my feet up on the couch and, you know, throw on a game um, and just chill instead, you know, get up, move around, but it's very light. It's not a super intense thing. And it's not a super long thing. And that uh, from a day to day basis can be enough to kind of help boost your recovery. So if you do like an intense workout, you have a recovery day, intense workout, recovery day, as opposed to intense workout day off, intense workout day off. Um, it can also help people keep more, stay more consistent with their workouts because they're not having to get back into the habit of working out every other day. They're just keeping with it day in and day out. Is it possible for people to get the Instagram model body the look good naked type of body i want is it possible for everybody to get that body and then also to be healthy like to lift healthy mm. healthy to um to have i want to say to do healthy types of types of lifts is it yeah. possible to do all this stuff and then also get like that magazine type of body so the people that you see in magazines um that's their job all right and so because of that, 
like the amount of time that they're going to spend working out, the amount of time they're going to spend dieting. Uh, a lot of them are going to be using some kind of performance enhancement drugs because that that's their job. OK. And so their whole job is to look really good on camera. Uh, so is it possible for people to get that? Sure. If you're wanting to follow that, you know, th that kind of lifestyle. But I don't know that that's actually going to boost your health. What I would recommend instead is actually going about it the reverse. Use your exercise to first and foremost improve the health and function of your body. Use your exercise to improve the health and functions of, of your muscles, your joints, your cardiovascular system, your brain, boost your longevity, ward off chronic disease, and do so, do so in a way that you can keep coming back to it day after day after day, all right? It's not gonna be a four to six week quick fix, but it will be something that you can keep doing for the rest of forever which really is how you ultimately win the game long term all right so if you are wanting to like get jacked and shredded you know in you know by summer in the next couple months then you're going to have a completely different mindset than if you're like yeah i want to feel good 10 years from now 20 years from now 30 years from now 40 years from now and i want to make sure that what i'm doing today sets me up to do that to me, the latter is far more valuable, not only because you can keep coming back to it, but because by improving the health and function of your body, you're going to have a greater opportunity to look the way you want to look. By, by um, improving the health and function of your body first, you're going to have a greater opportunity to shed the fat that you want to shed, to build the muscle that you want to build. Because what you are doing for your workouts is not sacrificing your health and sacrificing the function of your body in the process. And so because of that, you are going to get a lot more like at bats, so to speak, because you get to keep coming back to your workouts and keep doing that thing. So I'm guessing because just because a muscle is very pronounced, you can see it. Mm -hmm. It's your body fat's low. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good muscle. True. But how how yeah. would you define a good muscle. Mm, yeah. So to me, there are kind of two components of, well, there's the, I, I, I'm going to talk about it from a muscle function perspective. Okay. And the function okay. of muscle is essentially to contract. All right. And so there's the mechanical side of contraction and there's the electrical side of contraction, the kind of the, uh, the signal from the ner central nervous system to the muscles getting it to contract. Okay. So from a mechanical side of contraction, all right? That's what a lot of people think of um, when they're thinking of, you know, like lifting weights and building muscle and everything like that, like kind of really um, strengthening the actual structure of the muscle itself. But there's a whole other side to that. So what you're saying, Duran, where it's like, hey, like those, that guy's arms look great, like biceps popping, looking amazing. Structurally, to me, like that mechanical side is probably pretty solid. Okay. But the electrical side of contraction may not be there. Okay. Like he's gotten the structure to grow. All right. But does he have the signal from the central nervous system to the muscle telling it to contract? And the reason why this is so important is because you can build as big of an engine under the hood of your car as you want. But if it's not connected, if the battery cables are loose or the battery cables are not connected, you can't access anything that's going on with the muscle. And so when you go to try to use that muscle in your, in your daily life, you're not going to be able to have the function to be able to really access everything that you've tried to build in the gym. However, if you can strengthen that neurological component, that signal going from your central nervous system to your muscles, telling those muscles to contract, now you can access everything that you've built up in the gym. Just like you tighten up your battery cables and all of a sudden all the horsepower, all the torque that is already built into the engine, you can access immediately. The same goes when you strengthen that, that uh, signal from your central nervous system, your brain and spinal cord going to the muscles, all that horsepower, all that torque that you've built into the structure of the muscle itself, you get to access. And so to me, you need to consider both of those. And that's why doing things like considering your range of motion, being very mindful of how much you are moving, being mindful of the speed with which you are moving and keeping a strong mind muscle connection while you're working out are so important because it's not just about the structural 
piece, the mechanical side of contraction, it's also about the neurological piece, that electrical side of contraction, and respecting your range of motion, um, being mindful of your speed, and keeping a strong mind-muscle connection will all help to reinforce the uh, the neurological side of contraction, which ultimately overall will allow you to use and, and access all the results that you're trying to get from the gym. So how does somebody improve the electrical phase of contraction? Mm -hmm. Most famously, you, you commonly hear people saying like, oh, I can't like, I can't turn on my lower abs. You know, my yeah. lower abs, I don't know how to contract my lower abs or something yep. like that. How does yeah. somebody like improve that? Sure. So a couple of ways. Um, first and foremost, the way that I find to work day in and day out um, is something called muscle activation techniques is a, uh, you know, a modality that I've been trained in for, um, geez, 12 years now, um, you know, studied under the developer directly uh, based in Denver, Colorado, and uh, Greg Roscoff is the name. And uh, this is to me, what I've seen to be like the single best thing that somebody could do to really strengthen and improve that electrical side of contraction. Uh, the challenge with it is you need a practitioner available. You need to have access to a practitioner. So if you're in an area that doesn't have a practitioner or if you are, um, if, if you know, schedule wise, it doesn't work for you to get to a practitioner. You're not going to beat getting to a practitioner, but the kind of step that I would then recommend is to practice focusing on squeezing different areas of your body, okay? So what does this look like? It looks like, hey, you know what? I'm about to go and do a, uh, you know, a, a, an upper body day, okay? So I'm gonna work my chest, I'm gonna work my shoulders, I'm gonna work my biceps, my triceps, my back, okay? Before I go in, I want to focus on trying to just connect with and squeeze those different areas of my body. Can I make a mind muscle connection to my chest? Can I make a mind muscle connection to my shoulders, my biceps? Can I feel those areas squeeze my triceps, my back, the back of my shoulders, my lats? Can I make that mind muscle connection? Okay. And then can I sustain that mind muscle connection? So when I go in, can I, yes, can I feel my chest squeeze? And then can I kind of like increase the intensity of it and decrease the intensity of it? like ramp it up and back off. Can I play with that? All right. Um, and do that for the different areas of my body. And then when I go in to my workout, before I do my first rep, can I kind of what I call like rev the engine? You know, I get under the bar and can I just feel my muscles squeeze the ones that I'm wanting to engage, the ones that I'm wanting to challenge? And again, can I make it a, great, a more intense squeeze and a less intense squeeze, kind of easing off of that? The thing that a lot of people try to do is they try to um, – they try to compensate with a lack of awareness through intensity. Okay. What I mean by that is like, if I can't feel my chest muscle squeeze, I'm going to try like really hard to try, try to feel that, uh, to try and make that squeeze. Okay. In actuality, you want to do the exact opposite. Okay. You want to aim to feel how light of a mind muscle connection can I make or how light of a contraction can I make with my chest before I start to sense it. And then just kind of maintain that and be like, okay, cool. Like now I can sense it. I'm just going to maintain there and then I'm going to rest. Maybe hold it for like three to five seconds. And again, mind muscle connection, how light can I make it? Three to five seconds. Okay, cool. And then, you know, do like three to five sets of that, you know, for each side. And then it's like, okay, cool. Now I can ramp up. Now I can do, you know, a, a more intense squeeze and then back off. And, you know, and, and I can play with that. So start with how light can I squeeze to start to initiate or sense a contraction, maintain that for like three to five seconds, and then ease off doing like three to five sets, um, you know, for each group of muscles that you're about to work. And that will start with the practice of that mind muscle connection. And then you go in and again, you like you rev the engine practice squeezing the muscles before you go and do the lift, and then use that squeeze to initiate everything uh, that's moving uh, that, you know, from, from a motion perspective during the lift. Um, one thing that you mentioned in your book that really stood out to me, it says that in order to grow your upper body, you have mm -hmm. to strengthen your lower body. Why is that? Okay, okay, okay. so 
Yeah, great question. All right. So actually, uh, that's a little bit backwards. So that was that was that was a myth that I was busting in there. Oh, so it's, okay. yeah, yeah. So it's actually that that is an idea that's commonly thrown out by the mainstream fitness industry of like, well, if you do, if you want to grow your arms, you do squats. Because when you do squats, you're going to get, you know, a, a greater anabolic hormone release, more testosterone, more growth hormone. And then when you go and you lift your arms, you're going to grow bigger biceps or whatever. It's complete nonsense. All right. It doesn't work that way at all. The anabolic hormone release. Yeah. You get more anabolic hormone release when you do squats, but it's so transient. I mean, it's so short lived in nature. There's absolutely no effect to going and then, you know, lifting biceps. In fact, there's studies that show they'll have people do biceps curls all right and then uh the they'll measure anabolic hormone release and how much uh pr muscle protein synthesis is happening within the biceps and then they'll have the same subjects do leg press followed by bicep curls measure anabolic hormone release and the amount of muscle protein synthesis and even though after doing leg press the anabolic hormone release is higher the amount of muscle protein synthesis within the biceps is exactly the same from one condition to the next. So what this means is that if you want your biceps to grow, you have to challenge your biceps directly. If you want your chest to grow, you have to challenge your chest directly. You can't lift legs thinking that's going to get carry over to your upper body because it doesn't work that way. Whatever areas of your body you want to grow, those are the areas you have to work directly. Okay, that, that makes sense. You know, cool. Thanks for clarifying that. Now, here's another myth. You have to damage your muscle in order yes. for your to grow. Yes. Now, that's been, I've heard that for like, people have been saying that for, for generations, for decades. You even hear it in right. martial arts. You have to like break down, you know, yeah. your knuckles or whatever in order for it to become tough. Right. Like, what is that all about? Yeah, that is a huge myth. That's one of my biggest pet peeves. So thank you for bringing that up. Okay, so here's the thing. You're absolutely right. There's this myth out there that one order to get your muscles to grow, you damage your muscles and then they grow back bigger and stronger. And that's how you get your muscles to grow. The fact is that that's just not true. Can muscle damage occur when you lift weights? Yes. All right. Can your muscles grow bigger when you lift weights? Yes. But damaging your muscles is not the driver of growth. All right. The driver of growth for muscles is, uh, something called signal transduction pathways, which are a, a series of biochemical reactions that tell your cells to change, either grow bigger, multiply, something like that, okay? And the thing that drives that is the amount of, in part, the amount of signal that's going to the tissue. So you get more signal going to your muscles, that will get those signal transduction pathways going faster, um, and, and then it will get your muscles to grow more. The, here's the thing with damaging muscles that people don't realize. Once you start to damage your muscles, you get an increase in release of these pro-inflammatory molecules, TNF-alpha and IL-1, okay? Now, why this is important is because both TNF-alpha and IL-1 have been shown to decrease muscle protein synthesis. So the thing that people are saying is, is, is going to be the driver of your muscle growth is actually one of the primary reasons why your muscles wouldn't grow. All right, because it's decreasing the amount of muscle protein synthesis that's happening, okay? Instead of thinking damage, you want to think challenge. You want to think a high level of fatigue, but staying just under the point that your muscles get damaged. So let's say like this is like the level of fatigue that you need to get to. And then if you go beyond that, your muscles get damaged. The goal would be to kind of get as close to that as possible. Never cross it, never actually hit it, but get as challenge your body as much as you can without damaging your muscles. That's how you'll get the amount of fatigue. That's how you get the amount of signal that you're trying to get to your muscles to actually create those changes. But you'll be staying under the limit where your muscles end up getting damaged, which, yes, it it, it sacrifices not only uh, your ability to build muscle. It also sacrifices your ability to build mitochondria, which are the energy producers of your cells. So kind of like your overall fitness, it disrupts insulin receptors. So it can actually promote insulin resistance, which when we're talking about like health long term, like that's not something you want. You don't want to develop insulin resistance. And yet this muscle damage is something that can do that. So can you explain what is insulin? Because as I was reading through the chapter, mm -hmm. when you really go into like glycogen and insulin, I was like, okay, yeah. I need to start Googling this stuff. I need to sure. watch some videos so I can really understand this chapter. Sure. What is insulin? Why is it important? What role does it play, et cetera? 
Yeah. All right. So insulin is a hormone that's produced by the beta cells of the pancreas. So actually myself, I'm type one diabetic, which means at present, my beta cells are not able to produce insulin. Okay. And so because of that, I have to use, you know, an insulin pump to get insulin into my body. Now, insulin is often seen as like a key, all right, that more or less like unlocks the cells. So when you eat food with, uh, that contains carbohydrates, uh, your body will break that down into glucose. All right. And your body doesn't want to have a lot of glucose in the blood because it creates different pressure issues within the blood. Um, and so it will either try to, sh it will try to shuttle it into the cells, uh, into either the muscle cells or the fat cells where it will uh, convert it to glycogen. Anyways, um, your insulin is kind of like the key that unlocks the muscle cells in order for the uh, the, the glucose to go from the blood uh, into the muscles. So it is a key. It, it is an extremely important part of kind of maintaining um, a, a, a regular blood glucose levels um, as well as your overall health. Insulin resistance is where the kind of keyhole of the cells metaphorically starts to get a little bit rusty, where the insulin that is the key, it can't quite unlock the lock quite as well. Um, and so because of that, uh, the insulin that you're producing is not as effective as uh, as it once was as shut um, for getting the uh, opening up the cell to get the blood, uh, the glucose from the blood into the cell. Um, and so what ends up happening is, is people's bodies start to compensate by producing more and more and more insulin. Uh, but if at the same time, more of their metaphorical key holes are getting rustier and rustier and rustier, um, eventually they get to the point where they're trying to produce a whole bunch of insulin. Those beta cells are just getting super fatigued, super tired, uh, but they're just not able to keep up with the demand um, that's needed in order to produce enough insulin to get the same blood glucose lowering effects. And that's where we start to see uh, blood glucose levels start to go higher. Um, that's where we start to see uh, a number of issues uh, occur when this happens for a sustained period of time, like decades, uh, different neurological issues, different uh, neuropathies, um, various forms you know, of dementia and things like that, um, even various forms of cancer. Um, and so because of that, uh, heart disease is a big one as well. Um, and so because of that, being able to not only minimize insulin resistance, but uh, potentially reverse it uh, if it is present really is of, most importance, of the utmost importance if we're thinking about long-term health and well-being. I was wondering when it came to like glycogen stores, like mm -hmm. how do you actually increase that or do you even want to increase your stores? Like, because you, you mm -hmm. can get your energy from your glycogen stores, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the easiest way is just going to be to through eating more carbohydrates. Um, and, you know, at some point, like your muscles will be full with glycogen, your liver will be, you know, have as much glycogen as it can carry. And then that's where uh, you'll start storing more and more within your fat. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a balance there where like you can keep eating a whole bunch of carbs and keep, you know, packing on the weight and you'll be, you know, storing, a, storing a bunch of energy. Um, and, but most people aren't really looking to do that. Uh, the reality is, is most people aren't really tapping out of their glycogen, um, unless they are exercising uh, really hard for a really long time, um, then they will start to, you know, burn through uh, enough glycogen that that they may start to notice notice a difference. Um, most people, if they're just kind of casually working out um, or you know not necessarily exercising every single day, uh, it's it's going to be far less likely that they actually deplete their bodies enough during their workouts uh, that they're going to require you know more glycogen within their work, uh, you know, or more more carbohydrates to kind of replenish the glycogen within their workouts. This is going to be more of an opinion uh, type mm -hmm. of question. I'm curious, like for martial arts, sometimes we go on these like ridiculous long runs. You know, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm all for 200 meter sprints, sure. 300 meter sprints. I'm all for that. But occasionally we'll go on these. I'm in Utah. So everything's like uphill, these mountains. Sure. Yeah. And we'll go on these runs that are like, I want to say like 20 mile runs and then like an hour, hour. <laughs> and it's just like, it, I feel like, and I'm a big guy, man. I mean, sure, sure. I'm, I'm a pretty big dude and I'm not, I don't, yeah. I'm, I'm not built like the, the average long sure. distance runner. Yeah. What is your, how do you feel about, cause I feel like it's like breaking my body down when I'm doing that thing. But how do you feel yeah. about these long distance runs? Like such a good question. Help? 
Yeah. So th there's clearly a trade off, right? Like if you are sacrificing the health of your joints during the workout, then to me, that's an issue. If you're sacrificing the health of your muscles during the workout, to me, that's an issue. What I will say though, is when it comes to, um, to, when it comes to creating an anti-inflammatory effect within the body with exercise, when it comes to stimulating your body's internal antioxidant production systems through exercise, uh, doing longer duration workouts is extremely beneficial. But not necessarily to the point where your body is starting to break down because that's when we start to see an increase in inflammation, okay? So a minimum of kind of 45 minutes, but more like an hour to 90 minutes is really kind of optimal to get these um, anti-inflammatory effects from exercise and these antioxidant, the increased antioxidant production system uh, with systems within our body with our workouts, okay? But if you're feeling like your body can't quite handle the 45 to 60 minutes, upwards of 90 minutes, um, then that's really where a lot of the strength training can come into play. So you can build up the strength. You can build up the function of your joints. So then you can go and, and use your body for those 45 to 90 minutes of just kind of continuous activity, whether it's running, whether it's biking uh, or swimming. Th those seem to be kind of the big three for getting this anti-inflammatory effect because it's enough um, areas of our body that are being used for a long enough period of time of just kind of continuous contraction um, for those, you know, 45 to 90 minutes. So to me, like if somebody's doing, you know, a run where it's taking like three hours, four hours, um, you know, at some point it's just like, okay, are you doing it? Cause you like it. Uh, I don't know that they're getting as much benefit from that, especially if they feel like their body is breaking down. What I will say though, is that uh, there's evidence to show that people who are in an elite physical condition um, have over a 10 times reduction in their rate of all-cause mortality versus those who are in low levels of physical condition, all right? So in other words, there's really no upper known limit. Uh, there's no known upper limit to the amount of benefit that somebody can get from exercising. If you keep getting in, be in better and better and better shape, then you keep getting more and more benefits from a health and longevity perspective as long as you aren't breaking your body down in the process to the point that you can't come back and exercise again the next day or the day after that. So that's kind of my take on it. Um, I am a fan of the idea of doing longer duration kind of steady state cardio, but using the resistance training to kind of build up the strength and the function of the body. So those, those kind of longer bouts can be, uh, can, can, can be sustained and can be handled can be tolerated. Um, and then there's also like potential brain health benefits as well um, from in, in addition to cardiovascular benefits uh, from doing, you know, the 45 to 90 minutes. But yeah, 20 miles. Um, I've never ran 20 miles in my life. I've run a couple of half marathons. Uh, 20 miles just seems grueling. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think through it. Um, I can definitely do like a long run if it's like on the same level I'm running on the track or something. That's sure. easy. It's just Utah, there's mountains all over the place. So you're sure. going to be running up a hill or something. Yeah. Um, what is, for me personally, mm -hmm. when I go on these long runs, mm -hmm. definitely I'm, I'm staying in shape. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty fit. Mm -hmm. But I feel like I get a lot of benefit when I do my 100 meter sprints. I'm um, sprinting up a hill that's 100 meters yeah. or any kind of like I feel like when I go back to my workout the next day or I'm training or I'm hitting the bag on sparring, sure, I can go, I can last a lot longer mm -hmm. and um, my resting heart rate is just like, I can recover so much faster. Nice. What is the benefits of both? What is the benefits of the sprints yeah. versus the long, the long um, distance runs? Yeah, great question. All right. So uh, the long different distance run is kind of what I was talking about from like an anti-inflammatory um, and antioxidant production standpoint. Huge benefits to that. Uh, there appear to be um, positive uh, brain health changes um, and cardiovascular health changes uh, with doing kind of a, a longer duration workout as well. With the shorter duration workout or the shorter duration uh, efforts, it's clearly like you are going more intense. All right. Now here's the thing when it comes to creating health benefits of exercise, um, 
it all comes back to muscle contraction. The, the frequency of the contraction, the duration of the contraction, the numbers of muscles that are contracting, and then the intensity of the contraction, all right? So when you're doing like a really intense 100 meter sprint, whether it's up a hill or, or on flat ground, that's a really intense effort by the muscles, okay? That gets all the, not only the metabolic processes of the cells moving faster and faster and faster, um, it gets those signal transduction pathways moving faster and faster and faster. Um, and it also gets a lot of the, the um, <clears throat> like the, what, what this enzyme called AMPK, all right? And it gets that moving faster and faster and faster. Why that is so important is because AMPK is the precursor to so many of the health conditions that, or so many of the health benefits, I should say, that we see from exercise, increasing the number and density of mitochondria. Um, the brain health changes as far as improving memory, uh, increasing brain volume, um, improving the the uh, executive function, uh, heart health changes as far as like, you know, regulating blood pressure and everything like that, um, you know, increasing um, is a process called autophagy uh, within our body, which is essentially where our body goes and kind of like uh, cleans up and clears out uh, damaged cells, uh, protecting our, our cells from reactive oxygen species like AMP. PK is is this like magical enzyme that the harder and more intensely you are working out, and the longer you're working out for, the faster this enzyme gets moving, um, and then you get all of these health benefits from it. So, to me, uh, there's extreme benefit to doing both. Uh, one, because uh, with the with the more intense stuff, um, you are going to be getting a higher intensity of the signals to the muscles, um, and so you'll get like a lot of bang for your buck in a very, in a much shorter period of time. And then from the duration perspective, um, again, from the anti-inflammatory and antioxidant production standpoint, uh, that's that's massively beneficial. You know, as you were talking, it was just making sense to me because when I'm sprinting. I'm like I told you, I don't wear my headphones. When I'm sprinting, I'm very cautious of how um, my hips are moving, mm -hmm. how the muscles in my legs are moving, how I'm gliding. Like sometimes yeah. I'm hitting the ground mm -hmm. and I'm sustaining that all the way up that hill. So I can, mm -hmm. I'm actually consciously thinking and feeling those muscles throughout the entire sprint. Mm -hmm. But when I'm doing my long distance runs, I'm kind of just going through the motions. I'm just trying to survive. Sure. You know? Yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking. I'm thinking this weekend what I'm actually going to try to do, I'm going to try to run on the track for a few miles and uh -huh. then really contract my muscles, focus nice. on contracting those hips, but doing yeah. it at a slower rate and yeah, see what nice. kind of benefits it can give me. Nice, nice. I like that idea. I'd be really excited to hear kind of how it feels for your body because yeah, I, th I think that'd be a nice uh, thing to work in for you. Yeah. And I think that the sprints are beneficial just because I'm, I'm feeling that muscle. So obviously I'm feeling sure. so focused on the muscle. I can see definitely the benefits the next day. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, what benefits do exercise have on your brain? The reason I'm really, um, the reason I'm really asking this question, because I know just from brain health, playing football, mm -hmm. having those uh, head injuries or yeah. um, just hitting consistently, same thing with boxing, mm -hmm. martial arts, you're sure. getting hit in your head. Obviously, that's not good. But what are right. the benefits that exercise has on your brain uh, longevity? Yeah, man, so many. Okay, so one, um, it can help to improve memory. Two, it can help to regrow areas of your brain. Uh, three, it can help improve um, what's called executive function, which is like your decision-making emotional regulation uh, centers of your brain. Um, it can help uh, improve and boost creativity. Uh, it can also help, you know, just kind of stabilize um, the neurotransmitters in your brain, kind of bring balance to the neurotransmitters of your brain, which is being shown to have immense, uh, immense benefit from a mental health perspective. And they can can also help to kind of balance out the autonomic nervous system. The wind, um, especially with like traumatic brain injuries, you know, repeated head trauma and stuff, uh, the autonomic nervous system can start to get into more of a sympathetic state, which is more of this uh, stressed fight or flight state. Uh, one thing with exercise and when you're exercising appropriately for your body, it can bring back balance to that uh, that fight or flight, um, that, that autonomic nervous system um, and bring you back into more of a parasympathetic state, which is more of a rest or digest state. Okay. And so that's really important when we're talking about, um, you know, again, you know, 
recovery from you know concussion or repeated head traumas, um, traumatic brain injuries, things like that. Um, and then looking at exercise from a uh, from a brain health perspective, thinking about you know various forms of dementia, um, Alzheimer's, things like that. You know, the in my opinion, uh, the research is not done justice, uh, or or the uh, the the takes on the research are not doing the research justice for how effective exercise may actually be at preventing and possibly reversing various forms of dementia and even Alzheimer's. Okay. And part of the reason is because all the data shows that when you exercise for a certain intent, for a specific intensity, specific duration for a, you know, a long enough period of time, uh, you start to see that the areas of your brain that that just shrink with aging, those get rebuilt. They get built back up. And that kind of age-related loss of memory of, of hippocampal volume, uh, that doesn't seem to happen when people are exercising, you know, in you know, for the again, the intensities and the durations and the frequencies that they need to be. And even in people uh, that have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, you still see those types of changes. Uh, the challenge is getting people that ha have uh, that are diagnosed with Alzheimer's and they're not necessarily at the early stages, but they're at, you know, more advanced stages of Alzheimer's, getting them to start exercising more consistently. But I hypothesize in my book that if it could be done, if you can get somebody that has, um, you know, various forms of dementia or, you know, a, a more progressed form of Alzheimer's to be able to exercise at the intensity levels for the durations with the frequency that they need to and do so at a long enough period of time. To me, the research shows that it may be possible to start to reverse what they are seeing as far as age, uh, as far as um, loss of hippocampal volume um, and, and the other things that and ultimately culminate in, uh, in, in what we diagnose as Alzheimer's. So, so there's a huge, huge component for not just like brain health in the here and now, but for uh, the brain health from a longevity perspective as well. So are, can you potentially prevent Alzheimer's, like just by staying healthy, staying active, challenging yourself, or is it just a way to delay it? That's a great question. So you can't, I can't give a definitive answer because you can't like split test the same person, right? So you can't say, okay, well, in this lifetime, you're, you're going to work out really hard. And then we see if you get Alzheimer's or if it, if it just got delayed. And then in this lifetime, you're going to work out really hard and, and see, like you're not able to do that. Um, but the research would suggest that if nothing else, there's a delaying effect simply because of the, um, uh, of the areas of the brain that are so strongly affected by exercise and improved by exercise as far as increasing hippocampal volume um, and the effects on, you know, beta amyloid plaques and everything like that uh, that are said to contribute to Alzheimer's. So it's hard to say and that this is, again, where like I feel like the research is not necessarily or the interpretations of the research are not necessarily doing the data justice uh, where it says, oh, you know, like there, there's nothing that could be done or anything like that. To me, there's a strong case to be made that like if you exercise consistently, you can at, at, at worst at least delay the effects from happening um, at best possibly, you know, prevent it altogether. But it's, it, it's hard to say within an individual because you're not able to like, you know, take that same individual under multiple conditions and see what were, what, what would happen. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can't hear you. <laughs> actually, actually muted myself because I had to cough too. Oh, no but, worries. Um, I have one final question. I want you to go over the five principles to help you exercise for life. Yes. Can you go yeah. over that, please? Yes, absolutely. And I'm going to pull it up right from my book as well because I want to make sure that I get this right for you, for your audience. And so this is right from uh, Closing Thoughts, really about the frequent questions. This is from Educate. Yeah, Five Stages of Fitness, How to Exercise for Life, Five Principles, 224. I'm pulling this up right from my book because I want to make sure I, I get it right for you because I That's know cool. that these uh, – these words were very important to me when I wrote them, um, and I want to make sure that I get them right for you. All right, so principle number one, exercise is designed to create a change within your body, 
All right. The reason why this is so important is because if we think that exercise is something that we're doing to get likes on social media, is something that we are doing to, um, you know, get our social connection. Not that social connection isn't important. We need to understand that exercise. If you're trying to exercise for life, you need to have the focus that exercise is designed to create a change within your body, specifically to progress the health and function of your body. And whenever you lose that focus that the workouts that you're doing are designed to progress the health and function of your body, you risk sacrificing the health and function of your body um, in order to do whatever else it is you want to do. Shoot the video for Instagram or, you know, win the pickup basketball game or whatever it is. So that's principle number one. Exercise is designed to, or exercise is designed to create a change within your body. Exercise for life principle number two. Exercise happens within your body not outside of it. All right. This goes back to a lot of what we were talking about with like the squeezing of the muscles. So while you're doing your exercise, your focus needs to be on what's happening within your body, not on all the stuff that's going on around it, not on the music, not on, you know, how many reps you have left to do or, you know, where you are ranking on the leaderboard or anything like that. Focus on happening on what's happening within your body. Because ultimately, exercise is designed to create a change within your body. That's what will allow you to keep coming back and continue to build your health day after day. Exercise for life principle number three. The current state of your body needs to be taken into consideration before you exercise and while you are exercising. Okay, What this means is if you had a weekend where, you know, let's say it's a 4th of July weekend and you're like, okay, cool. Like I'm going out, I'm staying up late, you know, I'm drinking or whatever. And I come in Monday morning and I'm like, oh, like my body's just, you know, not feeling it. But you know what? Uh, you know, today is, is legs. I'm going to hit squats hard. I'm just going to keep pushing through. It's like, you're not, you are trying to, uh, you are not setting your up up your body for long-term success. You need to understand where your body is at and then adjust your workouts accordingly. So understand where your body is coming into your workouts and be able to adjust things accordingly at baseline and then be continuously checking in with your body while you are working out and then make those adjustments during your workouts. If you're feeling something starting to feel a little bit tight or a little bit of you know some discomfort going on while you're doing exercise, change how you're doing it to then allow yourself to be able to not only recover better from the workout, but ultimately keep coming back to your workouts. Exercise for life principle number four, you must be able to recover from your workouts, okay? There are changes that can happen from a health perspective, a function perspective, and a performance perspective that you can see after one workout. But the only way you get to keep those changes is if you are able to keep coming back to your workouts, and the way that those changes become long-term and sustainable and everything like that is if you are able to keep coming back to your workouts. What does this mean? It means you have to recover from your workouts, okay? It means that when you go and you work out, you can't be so focused on just trying to completely deplete your body today that you're not taking into consideration anything that's going to happen in the next 12, 24, 48 hours, all right? Your workout today needs to set you up to come back and work out again tomorrow. That's how you win the game long term. And then exercise for life principle number five, exercise consistency is the key. When we talk about getting the health benefits of exercise, improving the health and function of your body, improving your performance, your strength, everything like that, it all comes back to consistency. Now, a lot of times when we think about consistency of exercise, we think about frequency, how often we're working out. I worked out four times last week. Am I working out four times this week, four times, everything like that, right? And that's a type of consistency. But there's actually three types of consistency. Yes, there's consistency of frequency. There's also the consistency of progression, specifically internal progression, which goes back to exactly what we talked about at the very beginning of this, of this conversation of, you know, how well can you connect with your muscles during your workout? All right. How well can you feel your joints moving during your workouts? How well do you feel the areas of your body being still that you're wanting to hold still? How, how aware are you of the positions of your body?
How do you feel in the hours that follow your workout? And how do you feel in the days after your workout? Okay. Are you waking up feeling achy, beat up, or sore? Or are you feeling energized after your workout? Do you feel after your workout like you just need to kick your feet up and throw on a game on the TV? Or do you feel like locked in, like you can be fully present with your family and ready to attack the day? Okay. And so all those three keys. Or sorry, and so that was uh, consistency of progression and then consistency of appropriateness, which is what we've been talking about all along, making sure that your workouts are matched to your body, respecting your range of motion, being mindful of your speed, and keeping that strong mind-muscle connection. If you keep the exercise appropriate for your body, you're going to be more likely to progress the internal health and function of your body and be far more likely to be able to come back to your workouts frequently. Ultimately, hitting the three areas of consistency, consistency of frequency, consistency of progression, and consistency of appropriateness, which is how you progress the health and function of your body, not just for the next week, not just for the next year, but for decade after decade after decade. How frequently should somebody rest and what does rest typically look like? Like after they work out? Yes. Like what, like sometimes you'll say, okay, am I going to take this week off? I'm not going to ah. work out for a week. I'm going to come back refreshed, regenerated. Is just not doing anything for a week. Is that yeah. the best way to recover? Not doing anything for a few days. Is that the best way? Or sure. is it like um, changing your workouts in some kind of way to make them just less um, intense? Yeah. Like how so, do you typically rest? So I'm a big proponent of exercising every day. Now, what we need to define though, or what we need to switch though, is how we think about exercise. Because if we think about exercise as something that's just supposed to beat us up and deplete us, trying to do that every single day is a recipe for injury. It's a recipe for disaster. So I think of exercise as challenging your muscles with the intent of improving the health and function of your body. Challenging your muscles with the intent of improving the health and function of your body. So going in, there are going to be days where I can exercise more intensely. I can challenge my muscles to a really high degree with the intent of improving the health and function of my body. On Sundays, my, my workout will be like a 30 minute power walk, breathing through my nose, and then, you know, playing with my kids at the park. I mean, the power walk, like I'm challenging my muscles, I'm doing it with the intent of improving the health and function of my body, and then I'm moving, I'm playing with my kids, everything like that. So, I, so if we have a really strict, rigid definition of exercise as, you know, going to the gym, doing the class, changing our clothes, getting super sweaty and depleted, then it's gonna be really hard to do that every day. But if we can switch our definition of exercise to, uh, to um, challenging our muscles to improve the health and function of our body. Now that's something that we can do every single day. Then you feel within your own body when you start to say, okay, like my body needs a little bit more recovery time. Okay, my bot, my me recovery time meaning I need to do a lighter workout. I need to do that twenty minutes, thirty minutes of just kind of steady state cardio at fifty to sixty five percent of my maximum heart rate. I need to take a deload week for me. I do three really intense workout weeks followed by one deload week. And I've been doing that since 2009. And it allows me to stay really intense during the really intense weeks and recover very well during that deload week. But it allows me to work out week after week after week after week, okay? And then within the week, when I'm feeling like my body's just not quite, like I just don't have quite the pop that I'd want, I'll just back it off a little bit. And, but I'll still exercise, okay? And I might, I might frame it as my mind as a recovery workout, but it's still working out. And what that does for me is not only does it help me stay consistent with my workouts, but it also reinforces the story in my mind that I'm somebody that exercises every single day. And instead of saying, okay, well, you know, I'll exercise, you know, if I get around to it, I'll exercise when my body's feeling good. It's like, no, I have this story. I have this belief that I exercise every single day, but I might just back off the intensity and just do something still to improve the health and function of my body, I still call that my workout. I still call that my exercise for the day. And then, you know, then when my body is ready, I'll go back and increase the intensity. So you said you have one week that's intense and then the following <laughs> week is less intense and you just rotate that? Um, so sorry. So it's three really intense weeks. Okay. Followed by one deload week. Okay. Yeah. So, yep. Is there any benefit to doing free weights over using machines? Uh, it, it's all about the challenge, okay? So, so what I mean by that is there are certain free weight exercises 
that are not going to be able to challenge your muscles to the extent that you would be able to do with a machine just simply because of how the exercise is constructed, the physics of the exercise with free weights, okay? So me personally, I'm a big proponent of using machines. Do I only use machines? No, but I am a big proponent of using machines because it allows me to challenge my muscles to a greater extent um, than, than, if I, than if I only use free weights, okay? Uh, there are benefits to using free weights because you have to be able to coordinate more stuff. And so the, pro the challenge with that though, or the difficulty with that is that uh, the more things that you have to coordinate during an exercise, the less you get to focus on any one specific thing. So if I'm trying to make a really strong mind muscle connection uh, to, you know, to my chest, to my pecs, okay, and I'm trying to use uh, dumbbells, uh, but, you know, I'm having difficulty kind of controlling the dumbbells in space. Well, now I need to really focus on that coordination of, of where the dumbbells are in space. And I'm taking my mind off of just focused on squeezing my pecs, okay? So if I find that to be the case, then doing an exercise where I don't have to worry about controlling where the weights are in space and I can just focus on squeezing the muscles, then there, there may be benefit to that um, to build up the strength. And then I can go back and acquire the skill of the coordination of like, all right, well, let's control the, where the weights are in space now. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. All right, Charlie. Thank you for uh, for coming here, man. I was really yeah, excited right about doing our show. I right learned on. a lot. I'm about to hit awesome. the gym right after this. Nice, so that's man. Why was, that's why awesome. I was really for some of those questions, man. I love it. I love it. But um, yeah, Charlie. His name of the the name of your book is Exercise for Life, correct? Yes, sir. The Exercise for Life method, exactly. Okay, awesome. Yeah. Um, any close? Anything you want to say before we end the show? Man, first of all, thank you so much for having me on. I, I really appreciate it. Um, you know, I think a lot of times when we think about uh, exercising and when we get caught up in the the uh, Instagram, social media uh, version of exercise, you know, we think about physique and performance and everything like that. Um, when it comes down to it, exercise is about your health. And there's really nothing better that you can do to have more impact on your health, on your longevity, than to be able to exercise consistently. And a lot of times when we think about, you know, our health and our longevity, we think, oh yeah, like today I'm going to be good. Like I don't see any major issues coming up in the next, you know, five to 10 years or anything like that. But we have trouble kind of uh, understanding the impact that our life can have once we look beyond just like our generation and kind of like the generation below us. Once we start to look at like two generations beyond us and we understand like, yeah, like if I'm around for my grandkids and like can really have an impact on my grandkids, that can have a that can have a huge huge uh, impact not only on their lives but on the lives of so many other people and stuff. But you only really get to do that if you have your health. And you only get to do, you do that. You only get to have that kind of influence and make that kind of connection if you are able to be, you know, fully present with the the, the people that you're wanting to be with. Um, and you need your health in order to do that. And when it when it comes down to it, exercise really is the single best thing you can do to improve the health and function of your body. But just make sure you're doing it in a way today that sets you up to come back and do it again tomorrow. Charlie, thank you for being here. I look forward to the next time we do this. And you yeah. uh, enjoy the rest of your day, man. You as well. Thank you, Duran. Appreciate you.